We are live with the Short Term Rental Pros podcast. I'm here today with Arthur, who is a tech founder in the short term rental space. He is helping hosts across the country or across the world at this point own their direct booking channel. And when I say that, I mean get in direct contact with their guests in order to upsell them or just have them book directly and not have to go through Airbnb or Verbo. So Arthur, you know, is a big player in the space. I've, you know, heard a lot about him. I've heard him on other podcasts and I'm super excited to have him here today. Geographically, we're actually pretty close right now, but Arthur, you know, tell us about yourself. Where are you from? How did you get into short-term rentals? Yeah, so I actually fell into short-term rentals pretty accidentally. Um, so my background is in marketing and branding. And I had my own consulting shop here in New York City. And I work for companies in all different verticals, furniture, commercial artwork, fashion. And I just happened to have gone to business school with someone who owned a short-term rental property management business called Heirloom, which when I met them, they had around 120 properties. And now they have a lot more than that. And they had a very interesting business model where they purchased and renovated homes with investors. So not a traditional property manager. And they came to me with the issue that they were 100% dependent on Airbnb and Verbo. And that's definitely the case for a lot of newer, quote unquote, property managers that are from the last, you know, five to 10 years who came into the industry, uh, where they built their business totally on third party platforms, which is a great way to start and a great way to get a ton of bookings. But over time, they realized, like most other folks in the hospitality space, that having a direct booking channel is really beneficial for a ton of reasons, whether it's OTA fees, controlling the terms of your booking or your stay or your contract, having that communication with the guests, being able to upsell things. There's whole sorts of reasons why they wanted to build their own brand. And so they asked me you know, to come in and both develop the brand and figure out the strategy to drive direct bookings. And, you know, based on my understanding of their business at the time, you know, the most logical place to me to start was with the guests that already stayed and loved them. Just because in this industry, Airbnb is like Kleenex, right? It's so ubiquitous. People say they stayed on Airbnb. So it's very hard to get your brand in front of guests that haven't stayed with you before or maybe aren't familiar with the idea of booking direct for a vacation rental. You know, that's a much harder audience to crack. But people that stayed and loved their properties, I thought, you know, this is a, you know, they have homes for 10, 15, 20 people. That's the audience we can start marketing to to drive, you know, considerable bookings. And they came back to me and said, we actually don't have any guest data either because Airbnb and Verbo don't share it with us. That's how I kind of got introduced to the problem that then we solved at StayFi, which was seamlessly collecting marketing data from not just the booker, but everybody staying in the home when they stay at a vacation rental. And and this model has been around in hotels for, for years. And yeah, Arthur and I actually talked the other day and I'm I'm looking to implement StayFi into my portfolio. I mean, things have been going well for me. They definitely, you know, over the last few years, Airbnb, Verbo have brought in hundreds, if not, you know, thousands of guests. Also at the location where I have a boat rental business, I've gotten a ton of you know emails through renters who have rented a boat, whether at my house or another house or what it may be. And I've and I've done I've done some email marketing and, and had some success, but really like lately I've just felt the urgency to just take it to another level. And you know honestly a big reason for me and it's just the realization that like Airbnb's algorithm can like change at a moment's notice. I've seen that a couple times now where, I mean, I've, I've done things to adjust and, and, you know, kind of play into what they want you to do, but just the fact that it just scares me out. Like I didn't like having a boss when I had a, you know, when I had a boss, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go deep into that, but essentially, you know, I, I felt like they had control over, you know, obviously my salary, my well being, And to be frank, Airbnb has control over it too at this point. Yeah. And you know, I, I I think Airbnb, it's a partnership. You know, they it's a partnership between them and guests and they're, you know, they're looking out for the guests and it's a partnership between them and hosts. And I, and I do trust that they're going to do the right thing, but kind of as like an insurance policy to, I don't know, they, you know, make some radical decision and I don't even know, I can't, I'm not going to forecast what exactly that is, 
I need to have a means of filling up my calendar that's not them. And, you know, the first step in direct bookings is you need a means of contacting the guests. So, Arthur, tell me physically, what do I need to do to get? I mean, I'm getting some guest emails. You know, I, I send a form, a feedback form. But if I want to like super, the, the issue with that is I only get one guest email, you know, and that's the person who, who booked, who fills out the form. But how do I get the email of every guest who stays at my house? Yeah, so our solution is we looked at a bunch of ways to collect this data. And the solution we landed on was what you've experienced as a guest at a hotel or when you're at an airport or a coffee shop where when you join the Wi-Fi network, a branded splash page or captive portal launches automatically on the, your device where you enter in your name, email, phone number to get access to the internet. So we were the first company to bring this technology into the short-term rental vertical. And so initially, I just wanted to purchase, you know, what the coffee shop used. But for a lot of different reasons, price, software, hardware, compatibility, for all sorts of reasons, the, the stuff that works great in those environments don't work well or are too expensive for short-term rentals. So that was really where we kind of decided to build a very simple version of our product, which obviously has evolved a lot over time. And it's a great way to collect data because joining the Wi-Fi is something that every guest is going to do no matter what. So we really wanted to collect it kind of in the natural course of this day. They'll, they'll, complain, like about, the... they'll complain about the checkout chores, you know, oh my gosh, I'm not yes. going to strip the bed. Like, oh no, I'm not going to like close all the windows. Oh, but you will do whatever it takes to get the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. So like products that, you know, we've seen that collect data like a guidebook or you know, a tablet, it's, you know, it's going to get some percentage of use, but it's nowhere near what you're going to get from the touch point of the Wi-Fi, where you're going to get basically every adult that stays in the property. And then we also like validate that emails are real, right? So we don't just collect a bunch of garbage. And then within StayFi, we have our own email and text marketing tools that are built for short-term rentals. And we also integrate with a ton of third-party ones. If you already use something like MailChimp and you love it, we can send the data too. So like, our system's totally open and we don't like force you to use our marketing tools, but that's always an option, especially for people that um, haven't done marketing before. We try to make it as easy as possible to set up your first email newsletter or to send an automated email to every guest that joins the Wi-Fi. Because uh, the most important thing is just to start doing it. We see a lot of people that are kind of afraid to pull the trigger, like they're going to send the wrong thing. But for smaller operators or hosts or people that own properties, right? Kind of that informal feeling is kind of the vibe of the authentic experience of being a short term rental host. So, you know, I tell people, you know, even plain text emails, just introducing who you are, why you're not Airbnb, right? We let Airbnb take all the brand value for the great experiences that people are offering, right? Which is a real shame. Or every time someone... all, the, all the shade and hate. When someone has yeah, a well, it works both ways. <laughs> but if you're offer if you're offering, you know, experience that guests love, you know, and the guest says, "I stayed in Airbnb," Airbnb is stealing all your brand value that you could be creating for yourself. Exactly. So, how many emails? And I, I've listened, so I know the answer here. I think it's. I'm just going to answer it. You've collected two and a half million points of data, right? In the last since you've started here. Mm -hmm. So and a lot more every day. Yeah. And, a, and so that's like, think about it. I mean, and you guys, what, what are you in the United States? Are you around the world? Where are you located? Yeah. So we offer services anywhere in the world. Although I'd say just because we're a U.S. company and started here, we have, you know, 80 to 90%, 80 to 90% of our customers are in the U.S. But now we have customers, you know, South Africa, Egypt, many, many, many countries in Europe, Australia. So we're starting to get out there more and more globally, but definitely most most of our customers are in the U.S. and definitely centered around those traditional vacation rental markets uh, that, you know, whether they're urban like Austin or Nashville, Scottsdale or a ton of, you know, ski destinations, beach destinations, the more traditional vacation rental markets. Yeah, and probably the places where there's traditional property managers who have really see the value uh, of, of your service. So if you've collected, let's say, two and a half million and two million of them are in the U.S., you're at like almost a percent of the U.S., you know, has given Arthur their email. The funny thing now is I meet people and they're like, oh, I've used your product or like I've logged in 
or we get customers that used us at like another customer's home, right? So we're starting to reach that point, which is like a little creepy where I could like, you know, look in our database and see if you've stayed in a property that used DeFi, which is kind of exciting that we have that level of reach. Arthur knows well, where you live. <laughs> if you are no. listening to this podcast, there is a 1% chance Arthur knows everything about you. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, we don't. All we know is you log into the Wi-Fi. We don't see any everything about you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, none of that is visible to us. Although people ask us all the time, they're like, "Can I see what the guests are doing?" I'm like, "Definitely not. And that's not, not yeah. gonna happen." Yeah. Can, yeah. You, can I install a, a camera too and then record the camera? Nah, that's that's not. So yeah. That's... Well, the one nice thing is that because of the captive portal, we don't talk about this much, but like. People can't and people can't add nefarious devices to the Wi-Fi because uh, if the device like can't handle a splash page, you can't get it online. So you can't add like weird, creepy cameras and other stuff to listings just because you can't get them on the internet. That is good. I'm glad to hear. So Arthur has everyone's emails, but also obviously the hosts. You know, they have the emails, and what do they then like? What do they commonly? Like, let's say I get, let's say I get your email, Arthur stays in, in one of my properties, you know, what's like an effective thing for then me to like email to you to, you know, what is it an upsell? Is it like, Hey, stay at my place next year and get a 10% discount. Like what, what's kind of the common successful best practices you see uh, your, your customers doing? Yeah. I say this step one is to set up, it's called an automation or a drip campaign. You may have heard of it. Basically, you can trigger an email whenever someone logs into the Wi-Fi, and then you can trigger subsequent emails certain days after that, like in a series. But that's definitely the most effective thing to start with. In the welcome email, there's a bunch of cool things you can do in our product to like insert property-specific merge fields. So basically, like if you tell, if you put into StayFi the URL of the guidebook of each property or the link to book this property again, you can create one email that says like, hey, first name, welcome to property name. You know, here's the guidebook to your for your stay. And if you want to book this again and get 10% off, here's a link to the property to book. And it will insert, you know, all the specific names and links. So you can build one email that works for all homes. I'd say in that welcome email, outside of just introducing you as a company, because you have to remember, most of the people you're going to be emailing are not the booker. And even the booker, if they booked on a third party, probably doesn't know that you have a brand and that you're the operator because most of the time they just think you're a quote unquote Airbnb, right? So we got to start just educating the guest to differentiate between you and Airbnb and how you are the reason why they love to stay and want to come back. So that's kind of like number one is education. And then obviously value. You don't want to just be emailing people book again, book again, book again, you know, what value can you offer in a welcome email? Obviously, things like local recommendations. You know, what do you recommend in the area? What are activities you like to do in the area? What are potential services you offer during the stay? You know, we have a lot of customers that use things like the Host Co., which has a bunch of is basically like a store for your listing that has a bunch of partner. You know, partners already in a bunch of areas like massages, chef, yoga classes, things like that. So all that stuff you could offer to your guests is kind of like a concierge service, but definitely local recommendations if you have it in a guidebook or just in an email, just so it's not just marketing, right? You're actually providing value for the guests during the stay. And then I'd say, you know, in seven to 10 days, people typically will program like a thanks for staying with us, kind of whatever your average booking window is, booking length of stay is plus a few days. Thanks for staying with us, reminding them again, you know, how they can book again with you directly. Often you don't even need to present like a code. Most people, when they set up their pricing, you know, their direct booking website by default will always be cheaper than third party sites just because you're going to remove those like Airbnb fees, which are changing. So like they were used to be more like guest fees and now we're moving to this other model. But if you just if you have your rates be kind of like the price minus the third party fees, they will already be cheaper than what someone would get quoted on a on an OTA. So you can really emphasize that fact. And but of course, if you want to give them an additional code uh, to use on your website, that can be also an additional incentive to get them to book again. And then typically people will follow up in like 30 to 60 days, 
maybe with reasons to return. Then you kind of really depends by destination or seasonality. Like, are you a ski destination? Are you in like Breckenridge where someone's going to want to ski three times a year? Then you might want to push them to book again, like, because they have so many drive to guests from like Denver, right? But are you more like a once a year destination like Hawaii? Then maybe in like six to nine months, you email them again, asking them are they going to return to Hawaii next year and use some form of scarcity to be like, hey, uh, you know, like January is already 80% booked. So if you want to like come back to this rental you love, you know, you should book now, right? So you use scarcity or like peak availability to drive, you know, like, oh, all of our weekends are filled and when you typically come to X destination. So make sure you book now. So then it kind of, you have to go into the mindset of like who your guests are, how often would they typically want to return, like what's normal. And then you can kind of build the cadence or messaging around that, right? And that's really more destination specific. Gotcha. So you are essentially, you know, there are best, you guys train on like the best, because I, th I think it's cool that what you guys do, uh, I mean, the analogy, you know, I'm going to give is like the, the fishing rod, but also teaching them how to fish. So you provide them the tool to get the emails. You provide them the software to do the direct marketing. Do you also teach them how to fish? Yeah, so we have a lot of trainings on like types of emails to send and what to do. That's something this coming year we're really focused on from like a technology standpoint. Is we're going to be building more kind of pre-built email use cases in a way like oh, you want to send an email around a new property launch? So I don't know if you've ever used like Clav... Like what we're like basically looking at is like a product like Clavio, which is like the premier email tool for Shopify, which is like the most common e-commerce platform to build your stores on. And they have so many like pre-built like checkout abandonment, you know, loyal customer emails, right? So we're kind of building these like pre-built templates or stories that you can really leverage. And that's definitely what will be coming like next year. And we'll be releasing them sequentially so we'll like b release them as we build them but for now we just have a lot of trainings around it and then we also within stayfi we have a partner called switchback and that's for somebody who typically is a little larger and just like doesn't want to do anything themselves they hire an agency to do all the email marketing for them and that's definitely very common when you get to the larger 20 50 plus size listing property managers you know switchback is an email marketing agency just for short-term rental and vacation rental companies. So we provide a lot of content and information about how to do it. But in terms of like, if you want to actually have someone else build all your emails for you, then we also have a partner that can do that. Gotcha. Because uh, we're going to talk startups now. We're going to get into the a little start. I know this show mostly I talk about best practices, pro tips for short-term rental hosts. For those of you guys know, I'm the co-founder of BNB Calica software company where you know we help investors, or realtors, property managers grow their business through in-depth property analysis and then sharing branded branded reports. So it seems like, you know, for you guys, you want, uh, you want to have a sticky product. You know, you, you don't want someone to sign up, buy a device, and then a month later be like, well, I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop doing it. So, you know, for you, it's like really in your best interest to have your customers get value out of it, right? So you, you want people to be using it and, you know, making more money effectively, right? Like, is that kind of, you know, one thing you guys look at or think about or, yeah, walk me through kind of your, your way of thinking of like how to have, you know, the best, let's talk startups. So give me, give me the, the rundown, not a, not yeah, from a, like, a sales yeah, hat, so like from a founder hat. Yeah. So, I mean, when I look at, you know, how can we be more like our success is only going to come when our customers are successful and perceive value in the product, right? So you're totally spot on there. And historically, we've had very low churn. But I will say when we see customers decide they don't want to continue, the number one reason, other, which is actually people deciding they don't want to do short-term rentals anymore, which is one that we're seeing more, actually, just because people are like, I'm converting it back to a long-term rental, which is fine, right? Short-term rentals are not for everybody. Then the next one is like, they've been collecting emails, but they never did anything with them. So coming in January, we're actually going to change some of our pricing works where email marketing will become free, at like the lowest tiers. So we have like this add on email marketing product and we're actually lowering the price for it because we want people who have 10, 20, 50, 100 contacts 
to start right away and not be like, oh, I don't want to pay a monthly fee to email 100 people, right? So we're going to make it free for those lower tiers just so that there's no cost barrier to getting started. And then, then what will come after that are kind of those pre-built even more there's like a bunch of pre-built templates, but really like we're going to do one, two, three, and you'll launch this specific type of email, right? So it's all kind of laid out for you step by step. So that's kind of on the email engagement side. I'd say the other side is right now the product value is really built around this rebooking story, which is a fantastic one. And direct bookings are a huge priority for many people in the industry. And now taking direct bookings is also way easier than it's ever been just because every property management software has really easy to use direct booking website tools. And some of them like hospitable are going like an extra mile where they like wrap in insurance and like every other product you would need to feel comfortable taking a direct booking. So doing it is way easier now. Um, So, you know, we want to help people do that. But the other area where we're now placing a little more emphasis is how do you achieve ROI with Stafi before you even ever get a repeat booking, right? So we're launching soon some new partners within Stafi where you'll be able to build or create free you know, stores for your rental property that will have a network of partners that you can like upsell to guests as well as the ability to sell any product you'd like as well as like mid-stay cleans, stay extensions, late checkout, if those are things you want to offer. So we want to start using our ability to get in front of every guest during the stay, because every guest will go through the Wi-Fi, to then market those upsells that now we're going to help enable. So within StayFi, we're going to have all the upselling capability and the ability to present it to every guest when they join the Wi-Fi and a bunch of other ways via text, email, QR codes, so that we can help demonstrate not just value from direct repeat bookings, but more revenue per stay as well. So Arthur, your success is host making money. That's really, that's, that's what makes the product sticky. And something that I think that you've done that's cool that shows, you know, kind of that, that buy-in from your customer base is you wrote, I'm going to say rose money, you raised money directly from your users. Can you talk us through that process? What made you want to do that? And, you know, if that was successful or not? Yeah, I mean, I would say as a consumer of software, I think it's very valuable to understand how this company you're buying a service from, especially if it's one that you're planning on using for a long time, how does this company operate and how do they raise money and what implications does that mean for their business and like their stability and what they're going to do, right? So, you know, you see a lot of companies in this space raise money from venture capital the thing is, when you raise money from, you know, VCs, you may have some success in this current whatever offer you're like providing or product you develop. But then because venture capital demands such a fast growth rate and needing to raise money again and again as you burn through cash very quickly and grow fast, those companies may have to pivot many times. And so whatever you bought from them may not be available in the future or they may just cease existing as a company because they're not, you know, the cash flow situation is not great for a lot of companies. And most VC-backed startups fail or are acquired, right? So, you know, when you buy from a company that's VC-backed, that can be a little scary, especially at the early stage in terms of like, does this company have a lot of longevity, right? Or if a company is, you know, purchased by a private equity firm, you know, what is going to happen to that service level and pricing, right? So a lot of these companies are going to have to raise prices in the future or their business plan is to acquire a ton of different companies in the space and cross sell and then also raise prices, right? So having some understanding of like, how is this company made can kind of give you some idea of what may happen in the future. or what's Arthur, do you happen. vow here today on this show to never sell out to a private equity firm? I can, I'm not going to promise anything about <laughs> the future of StayFi because I don't know what's going to happen. But for us, right, like I wanted to take Basically, there's a lot of new ways to raise money as a startup because of some new laws that came about recently. Shout out to Dobbs Act. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know all the details, uh, obviously. But but basically, um, you know, we use this thing called an, a roll-up vehicle, which is through a company called AngelList, where we could basically 
combine a bunch of investments from smaller dollar investments into one like entity that owns part of StayFi. And then that entity like manages distributions among all of the constituent investors. And that way we didn't have to go to institutional investors who may have, you know, unrealistic or their strategy is right. I'm going to have one $10 billion company and all 99% of the other ones can just fail, right? Like that can be great if you're the one company that has that outcome or otherwise for most people, they're not going to have a great outcome as a founder and the business may have a lot of turmoil and like issues as it scales, tries to scale very fast. Yeah, so they, I kind of want to take a middle, a middle route in terms of raising money from partners who really care about the success of our business. And we really care about their success as investors and customers. So through the Angelus roll up, you know, we could go to our customers, solicit them, provide them all the financial information about StayFi they wanted to know, our pitch deck, all that stuff. And then through that portal, they could invest $1,000 or $50,000, totally up to them to own a piece of StayFi and then be really invested in our success. And then, of course, we lean on them to give us advice about what they want us to build in the future. So in, in VC speak, the, the, the phenomena of a venture capital firm wanting their portfolio companies to be multi-billion dollar companies is called like being a fund returner. So when they analyze potential startup opportunities or investment opportunities, if they're talking with each other, the venture capitalists are talking with each other, they go, oh, is this a fund returner? Meaning, is this a company that has potential to be an exit for billions of dollars? You know, Arthur might have a company that's like on a very good growth trajectory to be, you know, 10, 20, 30, $100 million company, which is awesome, which is great. They're just going to go, oh, you think that like your projections are a $100 million, you know, whatever acquisition to a private equity firm, like next, next meeting. So you really like, as it's kind of like a, kind of like a, I'm going to say this, kind of like an adverse incentive network where it forces people who want to raise money to kind of be like the Adam Newmans, where they just say such outrageous things, you know, oh, this is going to change the world, you know, this is going to be the next, you know, whatever, this is going to be the next Tesla. So it forces you to like, just say things that are just so grandiose, and really encourages that type of behavior, which as you know, we and it, I, it also, yeah, and I'd say reflects on the buyer side is that I'm not I won't name any names, but they present a lot of vaporware to potential customers. You know, not only are we going to revolutionize and change the world with AI and like whatever other buzzwords they throw in from the investor side, but then they present that also to the software buyer of like, you know, we're the end all be all solution that does these 10,000 things. And then you look at the company and there's like four engineers that have worked there for two years. So, I mean, like it doesn't add up, right? Like how can it do what they're saying? And then, you know, sadly, we see people try to onboard with these products and it doesn't work out because the promise is so big, right? So our approach has always been kind of incremental improvements over, you know, a longer course of time that we really like test out with our customers. And that's not to like shit on anybody else because... If you raise a lot of VC money, you can build really cool things that you couldn't build under any other conditions, right? So it's great, really, really cool and awesome for certain types of businesses. In this industry, it's really hard because the short-term rental market is not that big compared to some other ones too. So on a on a relative just, relative basis, yeah. Like as it, opposed it, to like what's like the market size of like AI, you know, software for like factories or whatever. You know, it's like hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Compared to like what other sectors are energy or whatever that VCs are investing a ton of money in right now. Those are ginormous. When it comes to like what percentage, of sh if you're only working in short-term rentals, like what percentage of the market in terms of like software spend do you have to capture? It's very significant to have a VC appropriate outcome. Exactly. So I guess this was, was this like a internal battle of like, should we try this? And you know what, screw it. We're just going to dive in and lean into our customers. We're going to, you know, use them, allow them the opportunity to invest in us if they choose. And then in turn, that's going to create, you know, a good, a good incentive alignment structure where you're now creating products that actually help your customers. And if your customers provide you good feedback, that makes it a more valuable product thus, and then a more valuable company, 
they're rewarded, you know, they, they're bought into your success. So I guess, was this a conversation, like this was the route you wanted to do from day one, or it was like you toyed with multiple options and decided this was the best one? Well, I've worked for companies that raised VC capital before, and I just see like how destructive that can be to like a company culture. It just, you know, can be so, it's not even like high pressure, just like Hyper toxic. growth or die. You got it. Builds, you got it. It builds very like toxic companies. And as a founder, you know, what kind of company do I want to build? Like I want to build a cash flow bot positive business where we like reward employees that are like very successful at doing their jobs, right? But that's a fun, exciting business to build. It's not fun and exciting to be, you know, chasing VCs around the world and spending 60% of your time trying to raise money and then raising money and then having to grow really fast and then start raising money over again. That just had, I had no interest in that, having seen other people do it. Yeah. So in, in VCs, they say triple, triple, double, like they want you to grow 300%, you know, first year they invest in you 300% the next year and then double the year after. And like, if well, you're we're, not, we're still growing 300%, which is the good part. So I, you know, it's, it's better if you uh, can do that and don't need their investment. Exactly. So, okay. Well, we so might, we... Any software founder out there is figure out any way you can do it without, you know, raising money from institutional investors, especially at the beginning. Yeah. And, and for context, BNB Calc, we have not raised any a sense of external capital to this point. Now it's a question of like, are there different accelerator programs who could put us in front of the clients? Like that's kind of the conversation we're having internally. It's not, oh, who should we raise money from or should we? It's, are there like distribution pl our partners who would make sense? And that's what you call, what's the, what's the word for that when you like a uh, partner with uh, a strategic, like a strategic yeah. investor? So, but yeah, we didn't want to uh, raise and, you know, for me, short-term rentals allowed me to like not have to raise money because prior to building my short-term rental business, I did work for a startup that needed to continuously raise money. And I was like, I got to create like a business that cash flows, that's profitable. So when I go back into the, you know, the startup game, I'm not like I can build an MVP and build that first product without needing to, you know, raise a quarter million dollars or whatever, hundred grand or whatever it might be from investors. So I think Arthur and I have kind of had a similar head on our shoulders in regard to that. But yeah, what can you share? So I guess the information on your like, you know, you had to share things with investors and kind of make some stuff public. But like, I guess like, what are your, what are your growth goals? Or, you know, feel free to like share or not share where you're at and where you want to be. Yeah, so just in terms of like, we're in about 20,000 listings today. Um, you know, we'd love to triple again next year. That's probably going to be a lot harder. Obviously, as you grow, it's harder to like sustain that pace. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, getting to 50 ish thousand listings by the end of next year would be a great outcome. So, like doubling. The latest in context, like the biggest software players in the space, from what I can tell, like a Breezeway or a Price Labs or beyond, they're in like 250 to like 700,000 short-term rental listings. And I'm pretty sure that's larger than any PMS, although I might be wrong. I guess you might have more listings. How many short-term rental listings are there in general? I, like 6 million or something in the U.S.? In the U.S., it's there's a lot of different numbers. It's like 3 million, 10 million. What is a short-term rental? There's okay. a lot of people in this like gray zone between a hotel and a short-term rental. Yeah, so there's a lot of different numbers, but from like software company sizes, like I'm not aware of anybody that's in a million listings other than like the OTAs, obviously, um, but I could be wrong. But, um, you know, and those are all pretty global companies like up in the 700,000 range. So I think, you know, that would be a very ambitious goal to get to one day. But there's definitely tons of room for growth, even in just the U.S. So I'm curious. If we're only in 40,000 listings. So like Price Labs has, you know, you said like quarter million, 300 grand or 300,000. Uh, they you... definitely have more than half a million. Oh, okay. Definitely on the bigger side. Yeah. What would like a AirDNA have? I don't know if you know that number. I don't know the number. No idea. But... I think it's different when it's like not a per unit. Do they have a per unit subscription? Nah, they, uh, they yeah, sort of, they, of like... they want you to import yeah. your listings, but like you don't have to. So yeah, you don't go in and say how many you have when you onboard. Yeah. I'm thinking of all the businesses where you pay like per listing. Sure. Is like... That, the, that model, it's like, that. yeah. 
granted those models, you know, once you get a listing that's onboarded and you're, you're helping them and you're actually helping them, I would assume churn, which churn is like when a user stops using you, like stops paying. And, uh, and I'll just, you know, be honest for like BNB Calc, for example, if someone finds a property that they like want to want to buy or that they move in on, and let's say they're not trying to buy their next one for like two more years, they'll be like, all right, love your product. See you later. You know, they, they churn. So that's the word when they, they cancel. Or, you know, if someone might say, hey, like, love your product, but my priorities in life have changed. Like, I'm no longer looking for a short-term rental. Whereas you're on the other side is like, they already have one, you know? So I would assume like, it's pretty sticky in the sense where, you know, they've already made that commitment. They've already made the investment. They have to buy a physical device, you know, which for you, I mean, for me, I'm looking at, I mean, I've got, you know, my 25 listings. Like if I'm going to buy your a device and I have, you know, most of them are bigger houses. That's what like a couple hundred bucks for me. I'm like, if I pay that $200 per listing, you know, I make that commitment. Cause that's going to be what, like five, four, five grand, right? Five grand there. If I buy them for every listing, like if I make that commitment, like you bet your, you bet your tail I'm, I'm making that work. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty sticky. Yeah. I'd say, you know, most of the churn we see, like I mentioned before, is like for like I don't want to do short-term rentals or like I'm giving uh, up my listing like because they already have the listing so they're like yeah or they're converting it to like a medium term rental or they're just changing their like biz or they sell it and they don't you know, own it anymore which is pretty common I've seen that also we had some property managers get acquired by like Fakasa. that again you know unfortunately they just kind of do their own thing and they don't continue using it but for you know 99% of our customers they're very happy with the system and you know, our number one job is to make sure they use it successfully from like a marketing standpoint or whatever their objectives are. Some people just want to monitor Wi-Fi. They don't care that much about marketing. Everybody's a little different and what, you know, what their specific needs are. Yeah. So for this coming year, it's really, we're really doubling down on creating more value for the customer in not just through rebookings, because I want to be able to show you, right, if you purchased 200 devices or 50 devices, you know, sure, we're going to drive, you know, you're going to go from 2% book direct to 10% book direct over the course of 12 months. But let's, you know, increase your incremental revenue per stay like $50 on average or whatever it is, right? So we can show you more money up front. I'd say for property management companies, they typically pass some of the cost to owners, like the hardware at a minimum, because most of the benefit goes to the owner when they get a rebooking, right? Because you're getting your management fee, but the owner is getting, you know, 70-ish percent of that value. And obviously, they're going to get more money if they have more bookings and more direct bookings, especially. So that that's definitely common in the property management space where, where companies pass that, that cost on to owners when they purchase the hardware. Gotcha. So, so I guess you have two verticals, which is like the individual owners as well as the property managers, which for you from scaling perspective, it's definitely easier to go through the wholesale customers, which is the property managers, right? Do you have a breakdown of like the percentage of users on your platform who are, you know, co-host companies, property management companies, uh, as compared to just individual owners? You know, the number of our customers is pretty 50-50, but in terms of listings, it's like 90% property managers, obviously, because most people own less than five although we do have the customers that own an incredibly large portfolio of homes like 13 15 as an individual which is super impressive how they have built their business over time yeah i don't even know because i'm i'm partial property manager partial i own slash you know i've raised money to own so i don't even know what i would classify i have i'm having a identity crisis and a lot of people are mixed like you because a lot of people that are property managers started with their own properties and then all their neighbors were like looks like you could do a way better job than whoever we're using today. And that's when I talk to a lot of property managers, that's how they got into the business is they did it for themselves and then for their neighbors. And then they quit their job and did it full time. Yeah. So I think it's cool. You have a lot of, so this one, I kind of get back, like you have a lot of exposure into, into hosts, you know, like, what are you like, who's, who's being successful nowadays? You know, like, I know you talked about, oh, you're seeing more people take their short-term listings and convert them in the long-term or sell them. But who are the people who are growing? You know, who are the people who are are crushing it? Like, what are they doing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. 
yeah, I, I, yeah, now I'm just trying to think about where, obviously I don't have a lot of insight into their financials, right? I think like a lot of places, there were like certain markets that are, there's too much supply for short-term rentals. Um, but market, like overall in the US, like we're pretty much like from an ADR standpoint back to like 2019. So this like cataclysmic view that we like fell off a cliff, I don't think that's really borne out. Obviously, the operators that are going to be successful today are the people that have, especially if they're in an area where there's a lot of supply, you know, are people that have differentiated properties. I definitely think that's like number one, especially in very competitive markets. If we look at like, who do we have that's successful in Orlando, which is like property, like so many, it's people that have differentiated themed special like amenities that's definitely still a way to stand out. Or if you're in an area where most properties are this size and you have like the only nine bedroom home, you know, when I talk to people, the ones that have like differentiated properties, I see generally seem to be indicating that they're still very successful because they have a, a niche audience or competitive advantage. And then obviously, I think a lot of short term rental success comes down to operational excellence, right? From like cleaning and managing employees contractors right so you know people that are super well organized and are very savvy and how to set those things up in an efficient way are going to be the winners right so yeah i think a lot of people probably entered short-term rentals not quite knowing what they you know they were biting off more than they could chew and i think you know as things have softened or gone back to normal we're going to see more exits from people who maybe you know weren't in totally you know didn't quite know what they were getting into, which I don't think will be necessarily a bad thing because, you know, the best operating people will continue to thrive and we'll see kind of a little more calming of a bunch of new entrants coming into the space at such a high rate. Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of this goes to like why I personally believe like now is a great time to, to do a co-host business. Cause like you did get a lot of people who just kind of came in 2020, 2021, you know, that time period, things were just booming, you know, especially if you think like rural areas, but even probably the Orlando's just many places demand, demand for international travel, like completely evaporated. So, yeah. you know, Americans love going to Europe and spending a lot of money. And instead of doing that, they were going to Kissimmee, Florida and spending a lot of money. They're going to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So Folks were making crazy amounts of money. They weren't really working very hard. You know, they're taking iPhone pictures. Their properties were not being maintained all that well, but just demand was so much higher than supply that you could put a porta potty on Airbnb and you'll probably make money. However, then the times change, you know? Uh, still, folks who are good at the game and are continually trying to get better and level up and talk to Arthur, you know, figure out what's, up, what's going on. How's this whole direct booking thing? How's that work? What do we got to do there? You know, folks who are trying to figure out what they can be doing to, you know, increase a property's revenue. Maybe the market goes down 2%, but if your property is able to go up 3% because you implemented direct booking strategy, then you're setting yourself up. You know, when people quit, they go, oh my gosh, my property went down. I did nothing different than I did last year. Like, I don't know what must have just been oversaturation. That must have been in it. Like, I didn't change anything I did. It just went down and, you know, the property got, you know, people stayed in it and, and it wasn't well maintained. So I think like I'm kind of we'll, we'll see how the next few years play out. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of I, I get excited. You know, the more chatter I hear online about people like talking about this, like supposed apocalypse. And, you know, I I control what I can control. So like, you know, I, Arthur was talking about differentiated properties. I could not agree more. I mean, the property I'm under contract for right now, I'm going to add a movie theater. I'm going to add a ping pong table, a game room, uh, a, a gym, like just adding unique amenities, you know, fire pit. It has a pool and it's not, you know, it's not a $5 million property. It's buying it for 640 grand, but it's going to be seven bedrooms, 4,000 square feet. It's close to, you know, growing major metro areas. There might not be a lot of data that's going to tell me exactly how it's going to do. But I just know from experience, if you create it, you know, and it's, there's enough data, you build it, they will come. <laughs> you know, people are, are looking for these unique experiences. And I think Arthur used the word differentiated, but really 
it's it's unique. That's 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 the folk doing well today are the folk leaning into being unique. So I want to ask you. And I I know you didn't explicitly say this, but yeah, what is what is your pro tip? I know you've given a lot of tangible tips and you know takeaway and insights, but like for those listening, what is like one specific pro tip that can help them succeed? Yeah, I mean that that's so dependent on where they are, like in terms of the life cycle of their business, could be very different. Let's just say um, starting out from the beginning, they have nothing. They all they're looking up online and they're they're seeing fear mongering, but they want to get going. Like what what would you tell them? Yeah, I mean, it's really the block and tackling all those basics that you mentioned. I'd say definitely like pick a simple PMS, like own a res or hospitable. Obviously, listing on multiple the main channels in the US, which are Airbnb and Verbo, it's going to open yourself up to as much demand as you're going to get. And then start with some idea of how you want to brand your property, especially if you're probably like even just small ways to differentiate, like the home has a name, you put it in the property, you label things with it, you make sure you take that kind of branded approach in the beginning, because the faster you can start getting that in front of your guests, the sooner guests and make it easy for them to contact you to book again, right? Just even that organic exchange of like emailing the guest yourself and being like, hey, thanks for staying. Like, if you ever want to come back, just email me. That's just a way, great way to start building those relationships, right? So definitely, you know, great photos, list on major OTAs, you know, build up the like automated responses you need to be successful in one of those tools, you know, and that's like probably the most important thing to do at the beginning. Yeah, definitely. I know, what do you tell people to do at the beginning? Yeah, well, I'd say at the beginning and kind of the, the points, Arthur, people bought houses, they don't want them, you know, they don't want to deal with it anymore. They didn't know it was hard. Great time for co-hosting, like picking up, especially because Vacasa ran through and bought up all these little boutique managers and just are not serving their customers. So it's a great time for co-hosting. That's like my advice. If you're looking to get started, it's zero risk. You know, pick up some clients that Vacasa is underserving. And I'm, you know, folk I work with every day are doing like, honestly, pretty much every day, people in my program are literally doing that. There's obviously specific steps and things you can do to, you know, make that more likely of an outcome. But it's a great time for that. So, you know, timing is everything, startups, business, whatever it might be right now is an opportune time to grow a co-hosting, a uh, small boutique co-hosting portfolio. I don't know if you agree with that. Or yeah. And that's totally a, a um, relationship business, especially at smaller scale. It's all about your owner relationship and retention and communication, right? So, you know, that's why Vacasa has such high owner churn, right? It's just so impersonal. And you're dealing with people's potentially their most valuable asset that they own, and they're entrusting it to you, right? So from that perspective, you know, that's why, you know, in my view, it's like real estate, in that, you know, the reason why real estate is so localized with brokers is just because it's someone you want to have a relationship with, and it's totally relationship business. So I think thinking locally is is the best way, because it's very, very, I would say, zero companies have ever successfully scaled a true national property management business yet awesome and until those listening maybe one of you guys will but either way start small and start by building relationships arthur how can folk you know who are listening today how can they learn more about stayfi and uh, learn more about you yeah so if you go to stayfi.com we have a demo page where you can watch a demo of the product as well as book either a webinar or a one-on-one -on -one demo to answer any questions and get a tour of the product. The product is self-service. There are no contracts, minimums, one property, a thousand properties. You don't need to talk to us to use it. So you can go to StayFi, create an account, and just get started. So, you know, whatever path you're most comfortable with, or you can get started and then book a demo if you run into any barriers. So that, that's the best way to, to take a look at StayFi and learn more about it. Awesome. Well, Arthur, thank you so much for coming today. And yeah, everybody, thank you all for listening. Stay tuned to the next episode of the Short-Term Rental Pros podcast.